Welcome to today's OTC broadcast on peak oil demand. My name is Arnis Judsis and I'm affiliated with the University of Utah and the Energy and Geoscience Institute. I'd like to welcome our session host and moderator, Art Schroeder, and our distinguished panel member, Dr. Kenneth Medlock, fellow at the Baker Institute of Energy and Resource Economics at Rice University. Art will introduce Ken Medlock further and discuss the format of today's discussion on peak oil demand. Art Schroeder has a long history of contributions to the oil and gas industry and is CEO of Energy Valley Incorporated. He has contributed to OTC programs for over 35 years and has served on the OTC board of directors. Art? Thank you for that kind introduction, Arnis. Uh, of course, many of us know uh, Arnis is uh, Mr. OTC, uh, having served so long himself uh, as uh, chairman of that distinguished group. Uh, the process is about a year in advance. Uh, the various program committees identify topics that we think will be of interest. And we're rubbing our crystal ball and figuring out, OK, what will be of interest a, a year from now? And, and who would have known then that uh, the topic today, peak oil demand, would be so timely? Uh, newspaper articles uh, about electrification of everything oil company of the future, what they're going to look like. Um, not to worry too much, uh, there could be some, some money to be made in oil sunset. Then even this morning, uh, article about a Danish oil company turning into wind energy. So uh, we will dive further, obviously, into these topics. Uh, uh, after I introduce Ken, he will provide about 15 minutes of topic framing. I uh, will then go into uh, more of a discussion session, pulling on a few of these many different threads that we identified, such as sustainability, carbon neutrality, uh, energy transition, the role of non-OECD, the NOCs. There's really a, a number of threads, too many to, to pull on all of them. Uh, those of you that are familiar with these type of broadcasts, this is uh, one in a, a couple of series. Uh, there is an opportunity for participants to uh, uh, chat with the host and the other guests, and we will be monitoring that with OTC staff support. Uh, so feel free to uh, uh, communicate with us that way, if you would. Uh, Dr. Kenneth uh, Medlock in the James A. Baker and Susan G. Baker Fellow uh, Ship Program there at the Baker Policy Institute. He is a distinguished fellow there and serves on the advisory board of Colorado School of Mines and, and many other uh, distinguished positions. I, I think importantly, uh, Ken is called upon by uh, people like Fatty Barrel, uh, Executive Director of IEA, Mohamed Barkendo, uh, General Secretary of OPEC, Congressional Committees, Industrial Leaders, and Ken is sort of the uh, go-to guy for those for input on policy and strategies. And we're so fortunate to have him here today. Uh, Ken, take it away, please. Thanks, Art. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, this topic is is certainly interesting. It's, it's definitely not new. Uh, one of the first times I actually was asked to address it in a, in a public setting was at the um, uh, annual energy uh, 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 economics conference, the AEA conference, the Association of uh, Energy Eco uh, uh, Economic um, uh, Associated Economists. There's an annual meeting every year in January where, you know, big job market foray for, for newly minted PhDs. Um, the AEA hosts that um, uh, in different places around the country. And we actually held a session on this. Um, and it was quite interesting. This is going back maybe four or five years now. Um, when we did this, but a lot of the, the stuff that we talked about then is still very much in the center of the conversation today. Um, a lot of discussion about uh, where demand is coming from, where it is actually seeing slow decline, what is the driver of demand in places where you're seeing it grow. Um, it quickly evolves into a conversation about developing versus developed countries. Um, those who are sort of on the post-industrial uh, uh, side of the development ladder versus those who are trying to achieve 
um, higher levels of welfare and income, et cetera. So um, I am going <clears> to <throat> sort of as framing remarks start there because I think that really sets the stage for a lot of what we can address in Q&A. Um, and I'll note that um, in, in Art's introduction, he, he cited a few things that are really more focused on the supply side, uh, the producer side. And um, that is uh, very important, but it is also distinctly different from the demand side of the equation. Um, and I think that's an important distinction to make because as we go forward, we have to understand what drives demand for energy uh, overall, and then where oil fits into that umbrella. Um, who produces it is a subject worthy of diving into uh, ad nauseum. Um, and what's remarkable about global oil markets is they are incredibly um, deep, well-established, lots of different producers, um, resources located all around the world that can be produced by a variety of different types of companies. Um, it's a very heterogeneous landscape. Uh, and that's actually uh, critical for any discussion when we start to talk about um, who is going to supply the oil to meet projected demands. Um, of course, markets have to balance. And so at that point, you're just talking about well, what's the market clearing price. And, and we can certainly get into all of that stuff in the Q&A. But I want to kind of focus uh, my opening remarks here, my frame remarks on what drives demand. Um, as we go forward, I'm going to kind of start this whole conversation with this slide. It's uh, the classic Earth at Night view um, made famous by National Geographic back in the mid-1990s on the cover of one of their magazines. It's a, it's a remarkable rendering of uh, the lights around the Earth at night. Of course, it's not night everywhere, so you got a lot of satellites up there. Uh, taking pictures all the time. And, and what you can do is, is create a composite of the satellite photographs on clear nights around the world and you get this. Um, why, does it, why is it valuable? Um, well, you can look at it instantly and see where on the planet we consume energy. So the little white dots where the lights are on, that's where we use energy. Um, and you can also see when you look at this, some pretty glaring disparities in terms of the regional distribution of how well the world is lit. Um, the OECD, so if you look at North America, you look at Europe, you look at Japan, South Korea, places where people live in Australia and Japan, um, those are collectively the group of countries that we refer to as the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, that's the OECD. Those are the developed countries uh, around the world. Those are the countries that have driven discourse around energy, around oil trade, around geopolitics, uh, really been at the, at, the, at the heart of almost everything in the global scene for over a hundred years. Um, they went through their industrialization phase of development over a century ago. Um, uh, they are post-industrial societies, very service-oriented um, societies that consume lots of energy. Uh, and that's where you see the lights on. Um, collectively, that is a group of countries that represents about 1.3 billion of the world's population. So that's 1.3 billion of 7.7 .7 billion. Um, What's interesting even more so about that is when you project that out to 2050, you're looking at you know, mid-trend estimates from the UN globally, populations around 9.6 billion. The OECD is not really projected to grow very much at all, um, going from 1.3 to 1.4 billion people. So all of the growth, uh, as well as the majority of the rest of the world's populations resides in places where the lights aren't quite as bright. And so that's when we can start to drill down and, and focus on what we're looking at in this picture when we think about where growth is occurring and where it will likely occur as we move through the coming decades. And you can kind of put your, uh, draw a ring around India, uh, China, the ASEAN region or Southeast Asia, the Asia Pacific area. Um, collectively, that, that's a group of countries that has been growing at very strong rates uh, since the 90s. Um, really the driver of everything in textiles and manufacturing and industrial relocation, um, very export oriented types of, of, of economies. Um, it's also home to about 3.4 billion people. So you're seeing in that part of the world just dramatic growth rates and they're all at different points of the economic development ladder. And as a result, they're all at different points in terms of the appetite for energy that they currently have. 
So as we look out over the next 30 years, if we want to sort of just take our mind's eye to 2050, um, it is likely that this collection of countries will be the single largest driver of global energy demand going forward. Um, now, I haven't even talked yet about the other 3 billion people on the planet. They largely live in Central Europe, uh, Eurasia, the Middle East, Africa, and South America. Now, I'll just draw your attention to those regions because, again, very heterogeneous, different you know, levels of lighting, which really tells you something about the, 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 the rate of energy use in those countries. Um, if you look, for example, at, at Sub-Saharan Africa, um, it is not dark at night because there are no people. It is dark at night because those people lack access to modern energy services. And so in that part of the world, we're talking about over a billion people. So almost as many people as exist in the OECD, but over a billion people that do not have access to modern energy services. That is staggering. And what this highlights is when you talk about the world of energy, it is definitely a world of haves and have nots. Now, Will that be the status quo that is acceptable going forward? I can tell you it's not. It's definitely not. And so that has ramifications for growth and energy, energy demand going forward. And then the question becomes, how will that demand be met? If we just sort of look back over the last um, uh, you know, 50 years, so 1970 to 2019, this is all data that's you know, available to anybody uh, publicly. It's from the BP Statistical Review. Um, 2020, of course, not in here because that data is not mature. It hasn't been uh, published yet. But um, what you can actually see is on the left-hand side, OECD energy demand. On the right-hand side, non-OECD energy demand. So OECD, remember, is about 1.3 billion people currently. The big sort of uh, deep green wedge at the bottom, that's oil demand. And we're going to drill into that here in just a second, because that's really what the, the, the subject matter here is about. But just to put it in perspective so you understand where oil sits in the landscape of energy in both OECD and non-OECD economies, both of these graphs are on the same scale. So you can actually see uh, relative to one another what the developed world does versus what the developing world is doing. Um, one of the things that's interesting is energy demand in the developed world in the OECD has largely flatlined for the last two decades. Um, not a lot of growth. This is very typical of a developed country, one that's actually moved beyond industrializations, move, move towards the post-industrial phase of development. Efficiency begins to really um, have a much larger impact in terms of abating demand growth as a result of um, industry scaling or other sectors emerging, et cetera, et cetera. In the non-OECD, it's a little bit different because you're talking about a host of countries at varying levels of development, some of them are very low on the income ladder. As they start to develop, energy demand grows rapidly. And that is largely what you see from roughly 2000 through, uh, through the end of 2019 in this picture. Um, it should be obvious from this picture, if you just let your eye wander north, um, that oil, which is the green, red, which is the natural gas, and that deep or dark gray, it looks black on this screen, uh, is coal. Um, those are all hydrocarbons, and they are the drivers of energy demand um, and how it's actually sated, not only in the developed world, but also in the developing world. So as we sort of just think about that and think about what that means for the path forward. It is remarkable to also note the role of other fuels, other energy sources in this landscape. Now, you can look at the very top, the yellow is nuclear, the blue is hydro, at the things that you can see a little bit, um, but they're, they're growing, but still relatively small, are the purple, orange, and gray. The purple, of course, is wind. Uh, uh, the orange is solar and the gray is basically biomass. That's not always an environmentally benign energy source, but uh, it depends on the country and the application. Um, this just recasts the same diagram a little bit differently. So you can see growth over uh, on a decadal basis across uh, all the different fuels. I want you to focus on the green here because what you see is in the shaded green versus the solid green, non-OECD oil demand and OECD oil demand. The only time in which we've actually seen oil demand drop over this entire 50-year period is during the 2000 to 2010 decade and the 
actually 2010 to 2019 decade. It's very small, almost invisible, but only in the OECD. Growth in the non-OECD has dwarfed the declines that we've seen in the OECD. So that, again, just reemphasizes a point that I made about what is happening on the oil front. So if we drill into this a little bit more deeply, um, and I think this is, again, this is historical context, but it matters. It matters dramatically when we want to think about where we're going, because this basically defines the road as it's been paved. Global oil demand increased by an average uh, 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 on an annual basis, uh, about 1.1 million barrels a day from 1970 to 2019. Of course, this means the, you know, the, the, um, the growth rate is declining on an average annual basis, but that's an artifact of the math because the base is getting bigger. So you tend not to want to focus on that too much and focus actually what's happening in terms of absolute increases. It's generally been increasing. There's variation that re is reflective of economic crises and other sorts of things. But in general, you've seen really strong gr growth for 50 years. Um, if you dig in more deeply, you can actually see that same exact picture, but now split between OECD and non-OECD. What I meant or what I was talking about earlier when I said most of the growth is occurring in the developing world, that's very much reflected in this picture in the, OE, in the, in the non-OECD. The OECD is relatively meager in terms of demand growth and prospectivity for demand growth. The non-OECD, on the, on the other hand, has really been the driver of all of the growth we've seen for the last roughly 50 years in the global oil market. So when we look forward to 2050 or 2040 or 2030, that's where our eyes should 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 wander, is actually to the non-OECD, not the OECD. What's remarkable about that is when you think about the discussions that are driving the sort of impending doom of oil and how oil is actually going to fade into the, you know, and uh, slow, slow ride into the sunset, in some cases, rapid ride into the sunset, right? Um, a lot of those discussions, a lot of that discourse is being driven by what's happening on the policy front in OECD economies. And even there, it's not uniform. But that then, of course, begs the question, if the growth, the impetus for growth is outside of the OECD, does that actually matter? That's a really important question that we have to get a better handle on. If you take the same picture and split it up into regions or countries, you get this, you get this sort of representation. And so it's the same stacking. You've got the OECD on the bottom, the first three countries, and then you've got the um, uh, non-OECD on the top. And so it's a pretty um, uh, it's a pretty telling indicator with regard to how um, uh, how demand is actually growing in different regions around the world. In the OECD, and this is the one thing that I think is really important. It's pretty uniform across all of the OECD economies that oil demand's not rising. It hasn't been for a while. And so policies that are being uh, uh, taken on board, right? Um, policies that uh, are targeting broader electrification, targeting electric vehicles, targeting bans on internal combustion engine vehicles, all of these things that you see in various places in OECD countries, they will likely have an impact on oil demand in those countries. So yes, we can say for certain that we are likely to see a redistribution of the way oil demand matriculates across the world. Um, but when you look at what's happening in the uh, uh, non-OECD, you see different rates of growth in different places, which is largely reflect reflective of how those countries have grown uh, over time. So as we, um, as we sort of move away from this picture, you can see obviously on the non-OCD front, China has been a big driver of global oil demand, but it's not the only one. You actually have seen very strong growth in, in the collection of countries in the Middle East. You're seeing stronger and stronger growth out of India recently. Uh, in a matter, as a matter of fact, in terms of per capita income and the level of development, India is about where China was in the mid-1990s now. So whether or not as a harbinger of things to come from India with regard to demand for liquid fuels remains to be seen, but it's, it's worth noting. Um, of course, to put this into context for uh, uh, CO2 emission, um, you know, this is uh, uh, this has obvious implications. Um, it, when you think about uh, CO2 emissions and how they've been growing globally, most of the growth, in fact, all of the growth for the last 20 years has been outside of the developed world. It's a developing world discussion. And so whether or not this puts pressure 
on existing paradigms uh, and and energy uh, uh, delivery systems and supply chains to move away from oil or perhaps rethink the way oil is consumed, right? And that's another very important issue that I want to get to in the in the course of the comments today. Um, that remains to be seen. It certainly requires a lot of capital investment, requires some tremendous uh, innovation and adoption of new technology. So. Um, it's important to note that while that may seem a little more clear in terms of the path forward in the developed world, in the developing world, it is anything but. And I think that's where we really have to turn our mind's eye when we, again, want to think about the future of oil demand. So um, I only have a couple of more slides here. There's a lot of words on this one. I'm not going to focus on it. I just want to get into the question of electrification because... Um, just make a couple of comments here because that is often a major focus of of, uh, of discussions around uh, the future of uh, of oil demand. Um, oil is largely a transportation fuel. Yes, it's a major fuel used both as uh, um, uh, you know as a feedstock, as an energy source in in some of the harder to decarbonize sectors like the, the industrial sector. But it's it's also a massive transportation fuel. Liquid fuels are incredibly energy dense and they're easy to move, and hence. Uh, technologies have evolved uh, to take advantage of those uh, economic uh, benefits. Well, when you look at globally power generation, it is a fraction of global energy demand. And oil really doesn't occupy much space in the power generation sector. Globally, it's on the order of about 3% of total power generation. Uh, in some places, it's zero, right? When you look at this on a country by country basis. But Really, when we talk about how transitions in the electric power sector will impact oil demand, it is entirely with regard to expanding electricity generation and displacing oil in other sectors. So it's sometimes swept under the rug that if we just grow renewables, it's going to begin to displace oil. Well, that's not quite right because we also need to expand power distribution grids, expand electric vehicle access, expand charging. There's a whole host of things that need to happen. Um, when you take that same picture and you look at it through time, there is um, uh, there's a really telling uh, there's a really telling uh, way to sort of graph this. And, and what you see here is fuels into electrification on the on the bottom part, which are sort of cross hatched colors. And then where you see that solid gray, that green above, that's fuels into direct use applications. So the direct use applications are almost all fossil fuels and oil is by far the largest component of that. In the power generation sector, you see incredible diversity. Um, uh, you see growth of renewables. You see a sector that's actually uh, in terms of carbon intensity, reducing its footprint. Carbon emissions have still grown because of the expansion of coal and, and as well as natural gas. But um, when you look at this picture, you don't see much oil in the electric space, right? And so what we're talking about as we move forward is expanding that um, this electricity space up through this direct use of energy. That is a remarkably difficult challenge because of the capital intensity and the technology that needs to be deployed. If you recast this same picture in terms of market shares, you get a, a, an equally interesting view of this, right? Um, and this is another really important point. Oftentimes people will focus on shares of energy rather than the scale of energy. That can be a little misleading, quite frankly, because when you look at uh, a pie, if I have half the pie, but the pie doubles in size, you can ask yourself the same, this this the following question. If that happens, how much of the pie do I need for my footprint print to remain unchanged? It actually is only a quarter, it's 25%. So market shares tell an interesting story, but they don't really tell you a whole lot about what's happening to the overall level of demand for different fuels unless you are being cognizant of what's happening to the size of the pie or the scale of the market. And the one thing that's true about energy in general globally is it has been growing. It is likely to continue to grow. So as we look forward and we think about
all of those individuals in sub-Saharan Africa and other places where the lights aren't quite as bright. And we think about energy access expanding into those regions. It's really important to ask yourself the question, how will those energy demands be met? Will it all be electricity? Will it be a combination of electricity and other fuels? It's likely to be that because, quite frankly, there's very little to convince uh, me anyway uh, that it will be anything different because of the capital intensity and the energy density associated with delivering fuels or energy in different ways. So as you look forward and you start to think about um, you know, what's going on in the broader energy space and you start to think about how that energy demand is met going forward, it is critical to also understand how different policies and infrastructures that are in place, both regulatory infrastructures and physical fuel delivery infrastructures, can be transformed at what pace or be developed anew, right? Because in some places where we're talking about areas with very little energy access, it's, it's a greenfield venture. Um, and at some point, you have to recognize that Greenfield Ventures, while they look promising for prospects, for example, of leapfrogging existing technologies, also face the, the struggle of you need to be able to finance those, those ventures. And uh, that's where the economics of the situation ultimately matter. And to be blunt, uh, there's very little right now that's, that's uh, lower cost in terms of the energy ladder than existing fuels. Uh, such as oil, natural gas, and, and oil, quite frankly, is, is on the lower end of that ladder. And uh, quite frankly, so is coal. Um, so when you look out and you think about developing countries, there is a high propensity to want to increase the use of coal and natural gas or coal and oil to feed growth and energy demand. There is definitely pushback. There is limited access to capital. There are all sorts of other things that are sort of getting in the way of that, uh, which is pushing a lot of these countries to look more heavily at natural gas and um, um, complement that re with renewables. So thinking about how that ultimately affects the growth of electricity generation is one thing, but thinking about that, how, how that affects the growth of demand for mobility is an entirely different one. And mobility is really where oil fits squarely. And so if you want to talk about the future of oil demand, you ultimately have to get into a, a, a pretty protracted discussion about what the, um, uh, uh, what the prospects are for different mobility technologies to uh, matriculate into different countries and different places around the world. So with that, I will stop and we can open this up to q and I saw a few come through on the on the chat, but, um, but, but Art, uh, if you want to just get into a discussion, I'm happy to do that now. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Ken. Um, the the uh, road that's already been paved, if you will, uh, looking at the graphs and charts does help put things in perspective. One of the things that stood out to me was the um, uh, uh, rest of the world, if you will, uh, the non-OECD uh, today at 5.7 approximately and, and 2050 at 8.3. I, I spent a third of my career in the U.S. and never heard of rest of the world. I spent a third of the career uh, in the rest of the world from Egypt, Africa, other places, and, and then now the last third back here. And, and I noticed even in our industry, uh, but much, much more so outside our industry, the, the lack of awareness in the U.S. in particular of the rest of the world and, and their needs for energy. We're talking about peak oil demand. Uh, not peak energy demand. Clearly, energy demand is going to grow. So you're going to be faced with this sort of all of the above, I think, as opposed to uh, U.S., a very small percentage sort of wagging the tail on the rest of the dog. And if we're going to try to do that, then financing it. I, I, how does that work? Uh, how do we still use oil and how do we uh, sort of satisfy the, uh, I think, somewhat global concern about rise of CO2. Could you sure. talk a little bit about splitting the hydrogen from the carbon? No, absolutely. There, there's, there are multiple pathways to um, you know, uh, pursue when we want to think about the portfolio of potential options um, for, addressing, uh, 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 for addressing CO2. These, some of these are not mature technology. Some of these are still relatively um, uh, early stage, but they're very promising because some of them have, did, have been demonstrated, for example, in laboratories. We know how to do them. We just got to figure out how to drive down the costs. Uh, and that's where, you know, better understanding how scale can come into play might, 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 might matter. 
So what do I mean by that? Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, there are some interesting technologies, uh, and, and here I'll, I'll stick with sort of the engineering scope, um, and we can talk about some others as well, but there are some interesting technologies such as uh, paralysis technologies, which um, currently are relatively young. Um, we know how to do it. We've known how to do it for a while, but in terms of their development and the application um, uh, of the technology, still relatively young. But what this allows you to do is effectively make hydrogen from a hydrocarbon feedstock and drop out a solid byproduct because it's an oxygen starved combustion effectively. So you don't get CO2, you get a solid carbon. Um, that of course says, okay, well, you still have to do something with the carbon. And right now there are limited applications for it, right? You can, you can use it as additives in some chemical process, largely as an additive in paint as a substitute for something called carbon black, which is an incomplete combustion residue uh, from like heavy, heavy fuel oil, stuff like that. Right. But, but longer term, there are all sorts of very interesting initiatives that have real promise that are related to carbon nanotechnology, nanotubes, um, the development of advanced carbon materials that could potentially uh, displace um, uh, 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 steel and construction in, in auto bodies and airplanes, um, all sorts of things. And what's remarkable about that, which is kind of the interesting double whammy, is you get a carbon to value prospect if those markets, if those commercial prospects can be proven and, and you end up in a situation where you're utilizing carbon to lightweight materials and effectively improve efficiencies. So one of the biggest impediments to range in an electric vehicle is weight. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons, for example, like cobalt and lithium are so so um, they're prevalent because of their energy density, right? The capacity to, to hold a certain amount of energy uh, because it helps improve range on EVs. But if I could if I could take an EV and equip it with advanced carbon body parts, I could significantly lower its weight and improve the range without doing anything to the battery. So there's all these really interesting things that fit into the efficiency realm that if some of these technologies can be proven will bear significant fruit. And that doesn't mean oil goes away. It means we rethink the way we use it. Um, demand for oil in those so scenarios could actually continue to grow because of the overall growth uh, globally, but the way it's actually combusted and the way it's processed would change. Um, it, it, it would be a primary energy source, much as it is today, but instead of being refined in the classic pet petroleum products that we're used to consuming, it would be refined into hydrogen and, and something else, right? So um, these are things that are going on in labs, at, at, you know, at, for DOE labs, national labs, they're going on in university labs. There are some private enterprises that, are, that are, are, are deep in this, really thinking about the future of hydrogen, for example, and how you access existing infrastructures and leverage those to accelerate hydrogen use and, and, and address CO2 emissions. So um, there's a lot of moving parts. There's just unfortunate, we don't hear about them all. Um, we only hear about a, a small subsample of the things that are going on. Um, and in many ways that limits the scope of the conversation. And I think that's where a lot of the things that we see today go wrong because they don't actually incorporate all of these things that are happening. And, you know, one of the things that's remarkable about innovation and in the energy space in general um, is, you know, the world of 1960 was very different than the world of 1990. The world of 2020 is very different than the world of 1990. And I can guarantee you the world of 2050 will be yet yet again, very different, right? So the sector is always in transition, but I guarantee you in 1960, nobody had any idea what kinds of technologies either on the efficiency front or the combustion front would be coming out in 2020. And so I, I often say, you know, the, the next great innovation is in the mind of a four-year-old somewhere playing with Legos. That's definitely true in the energy space, and it def definitely has implications for the future of the way we use oil. But without a doubt, the scale of the energy system means we're going to need to use everything. We've just got to figure out how to address the, the carbon issue. Two of the uh, threads that you have there, one is scale and the other is financing or, or cost. Uh, we talk about the energy total usage in 2050 will be much, much larger. Hopefully that dark uh, half of Africa will be uh, lit up with uh, productive human um, capacity. I, 
Yeah, I, I see companies, to, uh, financing companies, uh, hesitant to finance uh, oil and gas or hydrocarbon in general. Sure. So you not only got pressure there from a policy standpoint, but you also have financial ramifications. Uh, and one of the questions was, uh, do we see uh, players, uh, Russia, China, sort of filling a void there where American um, thought process about uh, what's right and wrong as far as hydrocarbons go? Uh, do you see them filling that void? Um, we already do. Uh, and, and this is where we kind of get into a, a, a pretty a pretty interesting um, what are the geopolitical ramifications type discussion for what we're seeing with regard to access to capital and finance, project finance. Um, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative is, is a great example of where you're seeing Chinese uh, finance uh, really pushing forward with some, all, it, it's, it, that's all of the above, it's everything, right? It's, it's affecting uh, investments in uh, renewables and renewable supply chains and value chains, but it's also affecting uh, investments in coal. Um, you know, there's there's something on the order of 150 gigawatts of, of coal generation capacity with that's backed by Chinese fin financing that's that's being built outside of China. So when you just take that on board and you realize, all right, capital is fungible. If you pull the plug from one one area, it, it will come flowing in from another. This is a classic example um, of of a pretty deep literature on sanctions that has long shown that unilateral sanctions have very little impact. They have to be multilateral and they have to be broad. Um, and in terms of capital finance for energy infrastructures, that is not the case. So as the US and as the European Union sort of pulls back from financing certain types of infrastructures, it definitely opens the door for other regions of the world to enter. And you're already seeing that to some extent. So, um, yeah, the, the, it's, it's, a, it's a fluid space. Um, what that means going forward in terms of uh, U.S. presence, for example, in, in many sub-Saharan African countries versus Chinese presence and how that actually affects long-term supply chains remains to be seen. But it, it generally doesn't bode well uh, because you'll, you'll, you'll end up pushing some of those countries to deeper reliance on Chinese capital and Chinese expertise. I saw a, a question here that piqued my interest. Uh, I went to Georgia Tech back in the day, and we actually had a nuclear reactor downtown Atlanta. And uh, actually, in today's oil patch, I still have some, some graduates with nuclear engineering degrees that came out of that. Uh, and that was thought to be the future at one point. Um, as given that uh, the electrification is going on, the oil going into power is so small, do you see nuclear power um, uh, moving up on the um, chart there? It seemed to be a very small percentage on the graphs you showed. It's uh, nuclear faces um, burdens on multiple fronts. Um, you know, the obvious one is commercial. What does it cost to actually, you know, uh, site, permit, and construct a nuclear power facility so that you're delivering electrons in a reasonable time frame. And depending on where you are in the world, that can vary. In the U.S., it's incredibly expensive, and that has a lot to do with why you haven't seen it grow. Um, in other countries, it's less so. Um, but, of course, that then begs the question, is it less so because you have more streamlined regulation, uh, because you have um, cookie-cutter designs, or is it because you have less uh, 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 less stringent regulation and less oversight. And, you know, depending on what you're talking, which country you're talking about, it could go either way. Um, that, of course, then runs headlong into public perception. Um, I mean, we saw firsthand when, you know, the, the unfortunate disaster at the Fukushima facility in uh, Japan occurred back in 2011, you know, what the ramifications were globally. Um, and a lot of that was driven by perception and fear. But interesting thing about that, um, there's been some recent work done looking at the actual casualty rate uh, associated with that disaster. Um, and um, you know, some, of the, some of the stuff I've seen have, has indicated that there was actually more harm done in the evacuation process than from exposure to nuclear radiation. I found that remarkable. 
Um, and at some level, that needs to rise in terms of the importance of the discussion around the, the role of the potential role of nuclear power, because it is an incredibly energy dense source of power. Um, you can uh, it's scalable, uh, doesn't require a massive footprint and it is carbon free. So when you just sort of combine all those things, you sort of throw up your hands. You say, well, why isn't it bigger? Well, it has to do with with fear and cost. It's really that simple. Um, I have a colleague and I'll just throw this in there who uh, has a has, he published a paper a couple of years ago in the Energy Journal, a uh, peer reviewed academic publication that was looking at the optimal design of a power system with renewables, uh, with batteries uh, and all sorts of generation sources. And um, one of the remarkable things that came out of that is the optimal design of a system that has a large battery footprint is one that is dominated by nuclear and batteries because the idea is you, oh, you you scale up the nuclear power plant so that at night you're generating more than you need and you fill up the batteries and you discharge those in the day to load follow. Um, you might say, well, how is that less expensive? Well, because when you pair batteries with renewables because of intermittency, you're solving multiple problems. It's not just short-term dispatch issues. It's also long-term dispatch issues that need to be addressed, which means on, on average, um, you end up needing about three times more battery capacity to meet a standard day, for example, in ERCOT, which is in Texas. So um, if you do it with renewables versus nuclear. So it's an interesting thought provoking kind of thing, but um, it, it really does show that there is potential for nuclear. It's just got to overcome some of those, those, those perspectives, which, you know, perception uh, often drives reality. Uh, and unfortunately for nuclear perception is not good. Um, Ken, I'm seeing a number of questions on CO2 emissions and how we allocate uh, the carbon content, particularly uh, whether the discussion is sensible and what are we, uh, what are your thoughts about sustainability? You know, the emission issue is, is fairly large. Yeah, so I guess when you say allocate uh, carbon content, there's different ways to do that. So we've got the scope one, two, and three discussion, sort of where the emissions occur in the value chain and who's responsible for them. But we've also got the discussion about the different um, types of crude oil, because some crudes are more carbon intensive than others, uh, either because they're heavier and require more processing uh, to get to the kinds of products that individuals need or want, uh, or because the production process is more energy intensive. So all of those things matter. Um, in, in many ways, the scope one and two emissions associated with any type of crude are easier to track. Um, and, and ultimately, at the end of the day, everything that I'm going to say comes down to a question of measurement and verification. Um, we actually have to be able to accurately measure what's happening um, in order to address it in an equitable, uh, low cost way. And uh, currently, most CO2 emissions are estimated based on conversion factors. Uh, given what's happening at the points of combustion and and and, and transportation and use, et cetera. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, if we're going to actually be serious about uh, trying to regulate CO2, we have to come up with better ways to measure and verify emissions at every point along the value chain so we can actually figure out where the low-hanging fruit is in terms of addressing emissions. Uh, and that's not clear. Um, as a matter of fact, a lot of um, a lot of the ESG metrics that are pr trying to be developed keep running into that very roadblock. Um, and it's a big one, but it's one that, quite frankly, opens up opportunities. I actually did see a question about training future engineers and geoscientists. Um, you know, they're, they're in the best position they could possibly be in because they are, they are positioned because of their training to solve some really interesting problems. And I think that's how they have to go into the oil and gas industry. How do we solve these issues, right? How do we solve the issue because quite frankly, carbon, right, is nature's best hydrogen carrier. That's why it's so prolific. That's why we use it, right? It allows us to deliver energy in a very dense way. Um, we're after the hydrogen molecule at the end of the day, right, the bonds. Um, and carbon's fantastic at doing that. The trouble is, is we have to figure out what to do with the carbon once we actually sever those bonds. And that is, at its very core, an engineering, a chemistry, a physical that, that those backgrounds are very well suited to, to solving this problem. So, um, you know, it really is about um, being innovative and, innovative and entrepreneurial. But at the end of the day, we got to measure it so we, do, we know exactly where to focus our efforts. Yeah, yeah. 
I was also going to just add on a little bit more on the uh, policy and technology and perception, that sort of triangle there. You, you talked about the four-year-old uh, playing Legos is, is going to solve those problems. Uh, right now, it seems like uh, the perception in general may not be a very well-educated perception, and it's driving policy, technology sort of on its own cycle. Could you, uh, coming from the Baker Policy Institute, could you talk a little bit about policy versus technology versus public perception and uh, what our delegates here uh, today, some takeaways there as far as re-educating themselves or STEM you just mentioned, but. So it's a, it's a, it's complicated web, right? Um, perception, is often reality, uh, even though perception might not be completely accurate. Um, that is true across multiple dimensions. Um, changing perception can be difficult, particularly when uh, things become very animated or discussions about them become very animated. And certainly when you talk about CO2, in many circles, these are very animated discussions. Um, there is a broad, I would argue majority of individuals that uh, are active in, in terms of researching solutions to the CO2 problem. How do we actually address uh, not only abating CO2, but increasing resilience of infrastructure and ecosystems and everything else that are much more focused scientifically, right? They're much more interested in solving the problem. Um, the political discourse is, a, is an entirely different discussion. That is really driven largely by placating certain special interests. And in some cases, certain special interests have gotten the ear of certain politicians and are really driving a lot of the discussion. That ebbs and flows. I don't know how else to say that, right? Um, policy, when you think about policy and you think about policy guidance, I often like to think of it like a pendulum, right? In some, in some cases, it swings very far to the right and when it comes crashing down, it undoes things in, 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 in almost a violent way. And if it swings really far to the left, um, it'll actually come back and do the exact same thing in the other direction. Um, what we have to try to figure out how to do is increase, particularly in the energy dimension and the CO2 dimension, increase the knowledge base of the general consumer about where energy comes from, how it's produced, what has actually happened historically. You know, I, I had a, an interesting dialogue um, yesterday with a colleague about um, some graphics that they had generated because they saw these, you know, in a different presentation about uh, local air pollutants in the United States. So here we're talking about socks and knocks and particulates and things like that. Uh, and what was really interesting, and he commented, he said, I didn't realize this, but they've actually gotten much better since 1970. And I said, oh yeah, history is the greatest teacher. Right. So uh, in a lot of ways, we, we have to understand how regulations and um, innovation technologies have responded in times of intense stress to things that um, uh, needed to be responded to environmental pressures and have actually generated some significant gains, significant benefits. And if we can get to the point where we're constantly looking back at history and understanding how new policy changes and new technologies have matriculated into the system to have a positive impact, we'll get to a place where we don't necessarily start talking about banning hydrocarbons or banning oil or getting rid of natural gas, or we'll get to a place where we can talk about, well, how do we use this stuff and address the concern, right? And that's really where the conversation needs to go because there are, interestingly enough, technical solutions to addressing carbon emissions but not getting rid, rid of oil and gas or even coal for that matter. So, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of potential pathways that are out there, but we need to be open, more open-minded about the technological possibilities. And, and, and in, in many ways in the policy discussion, um, we're not quite there yet. Um, a lot of that's about education. A lot of that's about trying to elevate the conversation out of the mud. And that's, that's, largely what we do at the Baker Institute. I always say elevate, don't advocate, because <laughs> advocacy is for, for, for the political um, animals. Uh, elevation is for people who are in a role to, to educate on, on things, and that's what we try to do. Well, speaking of the education, uh, one of the questions here was thoughts about lower energy densities of renewables. Uh, I mean, one of the things that's so wonderful about hydrocarbons in your gas tank is it stores a lot of energy there. 
Uh, do, do you, you mentioned uh, nuclear, but do you see uh, renewables, uh, the energy density uh, really increasing or is that only going to be through uh, battery technology coupled with renewables? Well, I mean, we've figured out how to make renewables more efficient in terms of delivering kilowatt hours, right? That, that, that's ongoing research. Um, for anybody who's listening to this who's never been up to, to, to Colorado to visit NREL, it's the National Renewable Energy Lab. They have a fantastic uh, sort of a layout of, of all the different types of solar panels, for example, and how they've evolved over time. And they all still operate, and you can sort of see directly how efficiency has changed over time. So it's undeniable that the innovation is there, right? It's, it's actually been ongoing. Um, but it's also undeniable that these are still intermittent. They still require backup, which means they require either pairing with batteries if you want to give stability to load flow, um, or they require a different source of generation that can come on when they're not available. Um, that ultimately increases the capital load. So in terms of uh, energy density, uh, you can think about it in terms of kilowatt hours per dollar capital spent uh, in many ways, and renewables actually weaken that, that equation. They just do. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. We just need to be fully aware of what it's going to cost. Um, and what that should continue to do is drive innovations to help drive down those costs, but it still doesn't ignore the fact that you need to pair them with something else. Um, that, of course, brings this full cycle back to the nuclear discussion, which you know we've already had. But um, uh, at the end of the day, energy, energy density does matter. Um, it's incredibly important when you need to high energy use applications, particularly for industrial heating, for example, um, where you will need a lot of electricity to come in. And that's going to have to be, you know, if it's renewables, it's going to have to be complemented by other sources that are more stable. So um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of things to be said about the role of energy density. But the one thing that is definitely true, and this will take us all the way back to the very first slide I showed. Um, all those countries where you see the lights are very bright, where industrialization occurred, they actually drove port development and industrial development around those ports and the movement of goods in and out of those ports with very energy dense uh, uh, flows uh, or, or commodities. So you're talking about the use of coal, the use of oil, the use of gas, the use of nuclear. Um, none of that stuff was driven by wind and solar. And so I've had conversations with, with folks in Sub-Saharan Africa, leadership in Sub-Saharan Africa, who is at, they've all actually made that exact argument to me. Uh, it's, hard to, it's, hard to, it's hard to turn a blind eye to that, right? So when you think about how those countries develop, how those ports will develop, how infrastructure will build, how urban environments will expand, um, there are ways to do it sustainably, but it's hard to get away from the importance of energy, energy density. Uh, so some of the audience are talking about or asking about hydrogen as a transportation fuel. Will that affect the growth of LNG and what we supply in terms of gas? But hydrogen, uh, what's your opinion of that? Uh, hydrogen is really, I've actually written some stuff recently. As most recent thing I wrote was, was for the Oxford Energy Forum. Um, uh, they did an entire issue on uh, on hydrogen, and and I provide a perspective that really highlights, um, you know, I think hydrogen will be a successful solution going forward. There are still some cost hurdles to overcome, but it's a very diverse fuel in terms of how we produce it, which is what gives it so much promise. You can make it from renewables with electrolyzers. You can make it with from nuclear power with electrolyzers. You can you know, use electricity off the grid with electrolyzers. Um, you can make it through the standard way we make most hydrogen today, which is through methane reformation, steam methane ref reformation uh, with natural gas. You can put carbon capture on the back of that and turn the gray hydrogen into blue hydrogen just to sort of quote the colors. You know, the ever expanding rainbow of hydrogen is remarkable. And what that highlights is that you will likely be able to do that um, in terms of expand hydrogen production in many different ways in different places around the world. And it gives you options for doing it in a least cost way that's available in the location where you are. So principle of comparative advantage matters. So hydrogen has a lot of potential. It doesn't necessarily mean, however, that you will see it negatively impact LNG. It also doesn't necessarily mean you'll see it negatively impact natural gas in general or even oil. Um, because you can make hydrogen from natural gas. 
you can make hydrogen from crude oil, right? So you can still use those as feedstocks as long as you can do it in, a, in as low cost a way as possible and in a way that limits emissions. And so when you think about the solutions that are out there that involve hydrogen, some of them are in the turquoise space, which gets into that pyrolysis discussion that I, I, I uh, concept that I mentioned earlier, right? Those involve hydrocarbon feedstocks. So why not envision a world where hydrogen is ultimately what is used at the point of end use, uh, the point of combustion, but somewhere along existing value chains for producing and moving natural gas and crude oil, we actually have a pyrolyzer, which you could put anywhere, that you use to convert that natural gas or crude oil into hydrogen and a solid carbon byproduct, which and then you know, could be used for something else. And this is where innovations on the material science front are incredibly important because if we wanna see that effectively result in low cost delivery of hydrogen, if you have a value proposition from the carbon that's coming out of the process, that actually makes the entire thing much more commercially viable. And it allows you to deliver hydrogen at lower cost because you're also achieving revenues associated with advanced carbon materials. So you think about all of that, it should at least broaden your perspective on where demand for hydrocarbons, specifically oil and gas could go long-term because these are very real research topics that are being addressed in labs around the country in the United States, as well as in national labs. So these are very real, real things. These are not just pie in the sky things. It really is just about how long will it take for them to matriculate. And my bet is you'll see them emerge before you see oil demand go away. Okay. Well, thank you for those comments. I know that there is a series of comments about uh, emissions uh, from the comparison from the United States and other developing parts of the world, how are we going to resolve that? I know it's a political issue to some extent. Yeah, emissions, the emissions question is complicated. Um, it, it needs to be addressed. Um, how we address it is what really matters. Um, and my hope is, for example, in Glasgow, we see something that's more constructive, more solutions oriented, because um, the, the approaches that have been taken in the past COP meetings are anything but constructive. They're often great approaches for grandstanding and photo ops, but um, at the end of the day, we've seen emissions rise every year since the Kyoto Protocol was signed. So that tells you something about the effectiveness of those, those conclaves. So we need to be much more focused on solutions. How do we actually achieve solutions to these issues? What are the technical technological possibilities? Let's not throw everybody that we don't like into a cohort we would just want to get rid of because they may be the ones that are capable of providing solutions for these problems. You think about the oil and gas industry, for example. What, what do they do? They produce, they extract hydrocarbons from the ground. They move them in very sophisticated logistical complexes. So this is where you get into supply chain logistics. And then they convert them into products that are ultimately consumable. This, this basically amounts to converting long chain molecules into shorter chain molecules and sometimes going the other way, right? But we're talking about converting molecules. Well, when we talk about solutions to the carbon problem, that's what we're talking about. So at the end of the day, if there's a skill set that is out there that is going to solve this problem, it exists in the oil and gas industry in abundance. It really is just about you know, creating a situation or an, uh, 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 an atmosphere where those solutions can rise to the top and we can actually see some real constructive conversation and ultimately action. Okay. Thank you very much, Ken. I realize that we're closing in on an hour, so I'm going to try to close it up uh, a little bit. Uh, many thanks to Dr. Medlock for participating in this very important issue of peak oil demand. And thank you, Art Schroeder, for hosting and moderating the session is quite interesting. And then there were a lot of questions and comments um, on the side too. And thanks to our audience for posting your comments for uh, Ken Medlock. Um, the conversation is being recorded and there was a question earlier about whether it's gonna be available. It's available on demand on YouTube, LinkedIn and the OTC website, which is otcnet.org. Uh, so you can get a recording of that uh, a little bit later. And don't forget to register and attend the 2021 Offshore Technology Conference in Houston, which is going to be held at NRG. It'll be held in person this year.
August 16th through the 19th. And I'll close it uh, at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone stay safe and healthy and hope to see you all uh, very soon.